Divine Truth Feedback Discussions Jesus, Mary, and others give personal or group feedback to people who have asked for personal assistance. This is Session 1, Part 2 of the discussion Forgiveness and Dealing with Those Who Harm Me, where Jesus and Mary give some personal feedback to Sandra Tsai about her questions relating to God's principles and laws of forgiveness and repentance and address many common false beliefs regarding forgiveness, repentance, love, obligation, harm, and abuse. This session was recorded on the 19th of June, 2018, from 11 a.m. in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. God's definition of harm versus my personal beliefs about harm. So we mentioned just in the previous, uh, in our introduction, that Sandra often has difficulties discerning when she's being harmed or not. Mm. So, as do I, most people on the planet. <laughs> yes, you know, as do everyone, most people. Really. Yeah. So I thought it was worthwhile just um, quickly going through the differences between God's definition of being harmed, my personal feelings of when I'm being harmed, because sometimes um, some of us feel we're being harmed when we're not, and sometimes we feel we're not being harmed when we are, mm. and sometimes we get it right. Mm. <laughs> And this is something we've discussed a lot in the forgiveness and repentance sessions that we did, yes. you know, particularly the early stages of the forgiveness and repentance in session. In session one, actually, we yeah. spent a lot of time on it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So so it is a subject that most people are still not really grasping well, mm -hmm. because, because you've got to remember that it is God's definition of harm, not your own, that all of the laws yeah. are actually, you know, acting upon in yes. the soul. So unless we have God's definition of what harm really is mm -hmm. and how we have personally been harmed versus how we and also how we have harmed others from God's perspective, yeah. unless we have that accurately, uh, we can grasp that accurately, we're not going to be able to enter the forgiveness or repentance processes at all. Yes. So it's a very important part of the subject matter to actually talk about this definition of harm of God's versus the definition of harm that mm -hmm. we have inside of ourselves as belief systems. Yes, because I remember not long after I met you feeling very inspired about this issue surrounding emotional processing, that unless there was some truth to what I was feeling, for example, if I was crying about um, feeling like I've been harmed when I'm not, then unless, unless there's truth in, in what I'm feeling, I, um, nothing's actually going to leave me. I'm just reinforcing. And I see a lot of people in this state where they say, oh, I'm crying, I'm crying, nothing is changing. And it's usually because they are in their tears reinforcing a false belief to themselves, crying about that thing, believing they've been harmed when there's something else that they're skipping over. Yeah, a great example of that is this example of when we tell somebody the truth after they've asked for it. Mm -hmm. Frequently, after we tell them the truth, they think that we don't like them anymore and that, we, yeah. they, and that we've har they harmed. feel harmed. The reality is they asked for it mm -hmm. and it was the truth. Mm -hmm. So how are they being harmed? They haven't been harmed. So they might get angry or cry about how, you know, all of those things, but they're not crying about something that is actually real from God's perspective. Mm -hmm. it, it is just something that disagrees with their internal system. Yeah. And unless they f are more sincere about finding out what that is, they'll never actually be able to discover what God's truth is on the matter. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, this God's definition versus our own definition is a very important discussion, but we must consider. Emotional preclusion in the soul does preclude us from understanding God's definition emotionally. Yeah. And, and this is where we must work on our desire to have God's definition of truth rather than our own, mm -hmm. that, you know, and have faith in God's goodness rather than just have faith in our own personal capabilities. These qualities are necessary for us to work through this particular issue. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and while we can discuss it logically, at the end of the day, a person's not going to feel that emotionally until they actually work through the emotions that stop them from taking on God's definitions of truth yeah. emotionally inside of themselves. Mm -hmm. so, so remember, God shares the truth via the conscience, which is this beautiful mechanism God's provided to help us 
get into a state of forgiveness and repentance. Yeah. So God helps us fire the conscience, but the conscience mechanism we can completely ignore if we choose to, via, and, and choose instead to listen to our emotional belief systems that are in complete disharmony mm. with what the conscience is saying. Mm -hmm. And we frequently do that. So, so we need to understand that this particular question has a lot of complexity really involved it in it, involved uh, regarding the interplay between our emotional condition, which we discussed at length in the conscience sections of yes. the repentance and forgiveness, of how our emotional condition affects the operation of the conscience yeah. and therefore affects our ability to determine what the truth is. Yes. And frequently the laws, while they may act upon us truthfully, we frequently misinterpret them mm -hmm. because we want to. Mm -hmm. So we frequently go, oh, that happened to me because of this, when yeah. it, sometimes it can be because of the total opposite reason exactly. that it happened to you. Yes. So, so the problem with just responding to the attractions based around the law is that you're not receiving God's truth on the matter yet, mm. particularly when, particularly when, so while the law is operating truthfully, you're not understanding it truthfully, until you are able to connect by, with God via the conscience. And emotionally, you're not going to do that unless you have dealt with specific emotions about truth. Mm -hmm. so, so you can see this God's definition of what is true or real or what is harm, you know, truly harm, actual harm, versus our beliefs about what is actual harm is a, quite a complex subject of discussion. And we just need to say a few basic things about it, really. Yeah, yeah. So let's get on it, Tim. God's definition of harm. Let's just briefly summarise. What is God's definition of when I'm being harmed or hurt or abused? Mm. Well, remember we said right back at the beginning of our repentance and re forgiveness series. Yeah, in session one. I think it was right back in session one, but we said it also a number of times throughout, even in the conversation section and so mm -hmm. forth. Something that we reiterated uh, quite a number of times throughout the discussion is that Whenever we have a thought, word, a feeling, intention, intention or action, action, which we would label, which we have labelled all together and we've called it our behaviour. Yes. When we have behaviour that is out of harmony with one or more of God's laws, mm -hmm. whether that law be physical, emotional, ethical, moral or spiritual, yeah. we are sinning. So whenever there is a sin then harm has been done. Mm -hmm. Now, if I have committed the sin, then I have done the harm. Yes. So when, what's God's definition of harm? Well, if I've committed the sin, I've done the harm, and therefore, uh, you know, as soon as I've broken another. the law, yep. I've harmed others and myself and probably. And myself, yep. Because every time yep. you do break a law, you usually harm yourself as well as other people. So, and so we must remember that in my case, and I've flipped it over from our outline here. That's all right. We, starting we can... with myself first. Yes. So from myself first, I'm saying I must have disobeyed one of God's laws in order to create harm for you. Mm -hmm. I have to disobey one of God's laws to do it. If I have not disobeyed one of God's laws, whether you believe I've harmed you or not, I have not, yes. from God's perspective, harmed you. Mm -hmm. So so this is where we must understand that it's all based on God's assessment or the, the God's laws assessment of mm -hmm. our situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we can just say conversely, if someone else has broken one of God's laws in their treatment of me, mm -hmm. then in their behaviour towards me, then I have been harmed. Yes. And you've been harmed from God's perspective, not from your own. <laughs> yes. And frequently we think we've been no harm when actually from God's perspective there has been yes. harm. Yes, so, we'll talk about and that's that very interesting, you know, yeah. because on the on the planet there's a lot of belief systems about how you should act, how you should feel, how, what should motivate you, and so forth, which from God's perspectives are all sins that are completely the opposite of what God's laws are trying to get us to act. And so, you know, frequently our our concept of sin or what is wrong mm -hmm. is frequently grossly distorted just as much as our concept of what is love or what is right is distorted. Yeah. Yeah. So if we quickly apply that to our practical example, mm -hmm. when 
Sandra, is, if we just talk about the spirit influence side of the, the example. Yeah. Sandra is saying that spirits are abusing her. How, how do we correctly assess the harm in that case? Obviously, they have desires which are in disharmony with God's laws, but so does Sandra have desires in disharmony with God's laws. Yes, it would be, it would be more correct to say that both Sandra and spirits are abusing each other. Yeah. Right, from God's perspective. And others. And others, obviously, yeah. uh, through their actions. Mm -hmm. Now, the fact that the spirits did it when Sandra was a child... Yes. ...is, is a lot worse... Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, they actually chose to do it to a young child who had no expression of their will. Yes. So that, that actually makes the situation even worse. Mm -hmm. and, and so they have abused a child, whereas Sandra here, in her codependence with them, mm -hmm. is just abusing adults. Yes. Right? And there's a difference there. It's a codependence. There's a desire on the spirit's part to have this codependence mm -hmm. just as there is, there is a desire on Sandra's part to have the codependence yeah so so the reality is though that the spirits who are with Sandra have done more harm to Sandra than she has done to them because they have done it since her childhood mm -hmm. uh, whereas she has not mm -hmm. done it to them right yeah through some choice of her own since childhood mm. and crucially as a child we don't yet have a developed sense of self or desire or a, an understanding of ourselves as an individual. Exactly. So, so in those cases, God's laws uh, make people who harm us more accountable for That's what right. is done. So the spirits who are with Sandra are still degrading their condition, even though they've passed. Yes. So they have yet to actually leave the earth plane. They, they've yet to go from the earthbound condition into the hells of the spirit world. Mm -hmm. And they will go into the hells of the spirit world eventually. Once Sandra probably disconnects herself from them, they may do it then. Yeah. Or more likely, they will try to attach themselves to another person or another person mm -hmm. for a few times before they go ahead and actually go to the place where they created for themselves yes. through their condition. Yeah. Now, that that's what people, that's the law. You know, yeah. the, law, the law is happening that way. But to, to actually say that it's all their fault, mm is not accurate that because just they are doing because there are yeah. a con there are a number of people at fault here there's yeah. sandra's parents yes who in obviously through their treatment of sandra encouraged the development of emotions within sandra that caused codependence with spirits there are the spirits emotions themselves mm -hmm. which are obviously out of harmony with love that caused the their desire to influence sandra as a child but now as an adult there's emotions in Sandra where she justifies mm -hmm. the desire for fear and she wants them to tell her things that she needs to be afraid of. Yeah. So, so that you she know, can avoid self responsibility. Well, also because she, she can avoid imagined mm. pain. Mm -hmm. And that's all really about the fact that she wants to avoid real pain. Yeah. She wants to avoid potential future pain because she is already trying to attempt to avoid her past pain. Yeah. When a person goes through emotionally where they no longer attempt to avoid their past pain, they'll also no longer attempt to avoid future pain, yeah. ironically. Yeah. So, so the fact is that, you know, attempting to avoid past pain is Sandra's sin. Yes. That, that's one of her sins here. Um, it's in disharmony with the law of the way the soul works, and it's yeah. going to cause pain and suffering for Sandra yes. if she keeps doing it. And so in each case, we can see the analysis of this issue with spirits you can see that the spirits are doing harm to Sandra. Mm -hmm. Sandra is also doing harm to them mm -hmm. at the moment. Sandra has also been harmed by her parents. And also Sandra is harming herself mm -hmm. because she doesn't want to deal with specific emotions. And other people, in fact, and through of her course, demands. She's bound yeah. to harm other people yeah. because of the demands. Yeah. So, so only God's laws can access the things this accurately. Yes. Because at the end of the day, when we try to analyze it, usually we're only analyzing one part of the equation. Yeah when the reality is quite that there are many, many facets to the equation which God's laws all perfectly measure. So this is, when I all, this is when I always say, thank goodness God does that equ equation, that, exactly. you know, the tallying. Because, uh, and remember, God measures everything lovingly. Yes. So God takes into account for Sandra mm -hmm. that her parents created this condition inside of her and that these spirits have, have attached to themselves to her from a young age. God takes all that into account, but he's not going to let go 
of the issues that Sandra has, mm -hmm. right? There's still issues that Sandra has to address. God will display mercy for these other issues that Sandra's had to deal with, but there are the issues where she wants to hold on to her fear and she wants to fight for it. Yeah. These are her personal issues that while she maintains them, she's not going to be able to progress yeah. and therefore not going to be able to be helped. So, you know, we need to see even Sandra is causing harm to herself that she is not recognizing. Yeah. Right. Because she herself is sinning against the operation of the God's laws when it comes to dealing with emotions. Mm -hmm. Right. And that is an important factor to keep in mind. So having God's definition of what is harm yeah. is very, very important. And if you've got that connection to the conscience, sorts it out it sorts all that out <laughs> so so what a benefit that is to have a connection <laughs> to the conscience but if you don't want to hear the truth yeah then you're not going to have yeah. that connection to the conscience yeah. so you won't sort it out I, I love the way that god's truth about being harmed or about anything it's so simple and yet within that simplicity it accounts for a myriad of uh, scenarios and it accounts for the operation of the engagement of free will. Hmm. It's just an incredible thing. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Not only that, um, if I can just make a few comments about the conscience here mm -hmm. as well, because it's, it's part of God's, you know, God's being able to inform us about when we're being harmed or not. The conscience is this fantastic mechanism, isn't it? And Sandra's conscience is bothering her. It is. Because she wouldn't even be asking a question about forgiveness and repentance yeah. unless it was bothering her yes. see at the moment her emotional condition is she doesn't want to know <laughs> and yet she's asking a question yeah so why is that happening it's because her conscience is bothering her mm. about the subject her conscience is going you know i've got to ask this question <laughs> even though i really probably don't want to know <laughs> yeah. the answer to these questions i've got oh, i've got to ask I've, i want this feeling resolved in me this feeling that's being triggered by the conscience that's right but they keep telling me things that is not that i don't want to hear that i don't want to know <laughs> but i keep having this niggle that's right I and the niggle is god niggling her via this conscience mm -hmm. saying, yes you you still don't get it yes yeah. you're still not listening yeah. yes you, you know yeah. <laughs> these are the things that god's trying to do through the operation of Sandra's conscience to help her keep on going where she doesn't really want to go. He's trying to, he's like saying, here's a road, and Sandra's going, I don't want to go down that road. <laughs> and she's, he's going, God's going, yes, you need to go down this road, it's going to be good for you. Sandra's going, no, it's not going to be good for me. But, but right, even though all that's happening, she can't stay away from the fact that perhaps she should go down that road. <laughs> <laughs> and Sandra... That's it's also describing the last decade of my life. Exactly. So, yeah. you know. And it's the same for everybody. You know, it's yeah. like, like I say, these comments are the same for everybody. Yeah. This is why having a feedback session like this is so beneficial because everybody benefits from it. The, the reality is God wants us to take roads that we don't want to go down. And why do we even go down them is, is, is interesting <laughs> because... Is. Because the niggle that we get from the conscience often causes us to go down them, mm -hmm. even though we didn't emotionally really want to go down them in yeah. the first place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you could say for most people listening to Divine Truth, that's the case with their emotional processing. Most people, when they first heard Divine Truth, go, I don't want to process my emotions. Yeah. Why would I want to do that? Yeah. And so forth. So gaining God's definition of what is harm and what is not mm -hmm. is a key part to that. And the conscience is a key part to that. Yes. Well, and even it's even desiring God's definition emotionally. So, so we've outlined it very simply. It is very yeah. simple what it is. Well, see, this is the interesting thing for Sandra. She's open to to the conscience. Say, God saying to the conscience, Sandra, something's wrong here. Something's yeah. wrong here, and going sort of yeah. like stirring yeah. you up. You know, yeah. something's wrong here. Something's wrong here. And she's open to that, yeah. right? Which is which is great, great. right? Yeah. But she's not open to taking the action that God wants her to take. Yes, right or to yeah. listening to the truth about the matter, mm -hmm. but she is open to the fact that there is a problem. So this is frequently how God influences people through the conscious. He keeps going, there's a problem, there's a problem, there's a problem, there's a problem. <laughs> and sooner or later we get so annoyed by it that we start to ask questions. <laughs> well, sooner or later, in my experience, you have to face the that preclusion emotion head on, don't you? The, yeah, the fear, the, the desire to just go, I don't want to go where you're going. We have to go where you're pointing. 
we have to face that emotionally that experience yeah. that emotion yeah and, that, and that's one of the things god's trying to get us to do to, yeah. to be more god reliant you know yeah. obviously the first god knows that god knows that if if we allow more god reliance then we'll get there faster yeah if we rely on ourselves we're going to get there slower yeah. right god knows that he's not silly he created it that way you mm -hmm. know he's got all the intelligence and all the knowledge we've got a limited amount of course it's going to be that way we just need to come to terms with that emotionally come to terms with the fact that we don't know everything and that there is a being that does know everything that we can actually talk to and find out about yeah. everything and and this is why finding out what god's definition about you know what is harm is so important to us mm. and just finally <laughs> on your point about the conscience niggling what i notice is that a lot of people after they hear some divine truths Often it does open them up a little bit more to their conscience. It does. It niggles them a bit more. It niggles them more. <laughs> yeah. um, often it's the conscience niggling them that's caused them to seek some seek truth anyway. In the first place. Um, but then often they hear some of God's truth and all of that preclusion stuff gets stirred up. All the angry emotions get stirred the up. The angry basically. resistance that's mm -hmm. already been existing. But it's already there. Often under the surface. Well, it's under the surface because we live a life of comfort, generally. We avoid the challenge of yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you and I are not in the business of avoiding <laughs> challenges. No, but most people around us are even. Yes. They're still yeah. in the business of avoiding rather than the business of actually challenging. I, I, so I should say we're not in the business of supporting people in that avoidance. No, no, not so at all. So obviously having some contact with us or even listening to a video like this begins to stir those things up. Exactly. My point was then often, even though that's happening, the conscience is more enabled in a way. There's more sensitivity to it simultaneously. And what I notice a lot of people doing is that that situation builds and builds to a point where often we get to this point where we think, I wish I'd never heard any of it in the first place <laughs> because now I can't shut up this other feeling that I don't want to deal with this preclusion all these emotions that are precluding me opening up and mm. um, it's not the case that you're in a worse place and it's not the case that basically hearing divine truth or hearing some of God's truth is only speeding up a process that somewhere in your future you're going to have to go through anyway. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And when we say you're going to have to go through, obviously there's certain parts of it you don't. You know, yeah. the relationship with God, you don't have to go no, through. That's correct. And um, that is something that is is only going to happen by choice. Yeah. But but the other things in terms of becoming a more loving individual, you're definitely going to have to go through that. We we had a recent conversation with Sebastian, a group of spirits, yeah. Sebastian, who, who, you know, were quite proud of themselves having gone through the fact that, wow, now I know, you know, all these loving things that I had to work my way through. Mm -hmm. And they did it without God. Yeah. So you don't, you don't need to have the relationship with God to do that. Obviously, the relationship with God opens up other things that, you yes. know, as, as a person who listens to that conversation would find out. But, yeah. but you know, this is where we need to see that, that mm -hmm. unless, we, unless we do things God's way, then we're going to be on our own, doing yeah. our, our own way. And if we do it our own way, then it will be our definition that we're going to be following. And frequently that is very mm. flawed. But even if we follow our way, God's laws are going to attempt to correct that, even if we don't have the relationship with God. Eventually, so yeah. God's laws will enforce positive change upon us, and there will be an experience of discomfort while we move from an error-based position to a loving-based position. Yes. So this yep. increased sensitivity to the emotions that uh, preclude love and truth within us and the increased sensitivity to the conscience both of those things are serving us in that future. Yes. They're just doing it in a timing that we don't necessarily feel is good for us. <laughs> yeah. When we want to, to control the whole process ourselves, we're demonstrating basically that we're not working in our own best interest. Yeah. So, you know, why would we not want to do that? Because that's quite self-abusive to do that. So that's, yeah. a, that's something to look at. If you're in this state where you feel, oh, I want to do it in my good, on my own good time, mm -hmm. Uh, if you feel that way, then that's self-abusive yeah. uh, from God's perspective. Mm -hmm. And you've got to look at why you want to abuse yourself in that way. Yeah. So that's a suggestion that people need to yeah. maybe have a, have a th thought, think about. <laughs> All right. Well, that was a little segue, but we're very clear now on God's definition of harm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Not noticing when I am being harmed. So here I'd like to ask you about 
the situation where I may be being harmed, but not be sensitive to the fact I might be in denial, I might not even notice. Mm -hmm. So is it possible that I may have been hurt and have something to actually forgive someone else for, but I'm not even aware of that? Yeah, well, it is completely possible. In fact, in fact, highly likely, yeah. because everyone on earth has a flawed perspective of love yeah. and has a flawed perspective of what is truth. Mm -hmm. So because we have false beliefs about love and false beliefs about truth, we naturally believe certain things to be true that God knows is false. And we also naturally believe certain things to be false that God knows is true. Now, to give some examples of that. Mm -hmm. So if I've got a desire to maintain my addictions for codependence, yeah. there's an example where I would like somebody else to do something. I think they're nice mm -hmm. when they do it, but the reality is they're, hum they're harming me if yep. they do it. Yep. All right. Yep. So there's an example. Yep. Another example is um, remaining in relationships just to receive the benefits. Mm -hmm. So, so cool benefits. You yeah. see, you see this a lot, where you know some. You see women often remaining in relationships because they feel safer financially to yeah. remain in the relationship, right? Or men uh, renovating the kitchen so that they get sex. That's right. That's <laughs> like, right. That's to true. put it crudely. Yeah. You know? and, yeah. And, and and while they might not think it's that way, there is this codependency and and feeding another person's addictions for the sake of them feeding your addictions means that both of you are harming each other from yeah. God's perspective. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, the, this is harm perpetrated. And naturally, a person in a codependent relationship like that doesn't even notice it. In fact, they believe they it's like fantastic. It. Usually, yeah. they, you know, yeah. they love it. Yeah. <laughs> they, they think it's really good yeah. if that happens. Yeah. Yeah. You know, how dare my husband doesn't fix the kitchen when I want him to, you know? <laughs> I shouldn't give him sex now. You yeah. know, that, that is a common viewpoint, yeah. particularly in Western society, of course, in. In most third yeah, world societies, yeah. you wouldn't get away with that no. without getting abused, right? Yeah. Which is also uh, the uh, indication of staying in the relationship yeah. because of a prevention of your own death even. Staying yes. in a relationship is a, is a codependence which mm -hmm. God doesn't agree with. Yeah, yeah. Um, the desire to remain emotionally con disconnected, distracted and so forth. You know, you know, what does God want? What is God's truth? God's truth is... He wants us to feel our emotions. Mm -hmm. right? He wants us to process through them. He doesn't want us to be disconnected from them and he doesn't want us to be distracted from them. Mm. So every time you distract yourself from them and you disconnect yourself from them, you're actually harming yourself. If you try to do that to another person, you're harming them. So that would most have... people are happy with that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've, I've just broken up from my, you know, my uh, husband, wife, yep. slash partner, whatever. Yep. And let's go and get some ice cream and uh, mm. have some drink and go to the pub and see who we can pick up yep. so that I can feel good, you know. Yep. And most people would go along and say, yeah, that's a great thing to do. Yeah. And, and if you support the person doing that, you're a great friend. Yeah. When from God's perspective, none of that is true. Mm. You're not a great friend. You, you shouldn't be supporting it. It's wrong because <laughs> you're trying to get away from your emotions. Are you saying that if I've just broken up with my boyfriend and my girlfriend <laughs> calls me up and says, I'm coming over with chocolate and ice cream and DVDs. Yeah. You, I would have to say, you're very from you're God's harming me right now. Yeah. I'm going to have to forgive you for that. <laughs> from God's perspective, that is a sin. From God's perspective. And whereas the average person on the planet would go, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> of course, that's not a sin. That's, the, that's what a friend does. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know, there's a difference between going there and talking about the reasons why it broke yeah. up or whatever. That's more that's that'd encouraging. That would be more in harmony with yeah. love, right? Yeah. But but actually encouraging a person to be completely distracted from their emotions, that's not in harmony with love. Not from God's perspective mm -hmm. anyway. And remember here, we're talking about harm from God's perspective. Yes. Right. So another one is not wanting to know the truth. Hey, that's frequent, isn't it? Like, you know, you ask somebody their opinion and because really what you want to know is you want them to agree with your opinion. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? You don't want to hear the truth from them most of the time. Yeah. You want to hear what your version is of truth mm. most of the time. That, that's a sin from God's yeah. perspective, right? So, from God's perspective, we want to hear the truth, not... Yes. And we shouldn't ever feel like it's so bad to yeah. hear the truth. And I can relate to that um, as a kid um, where my parents tried to shield me from matters so they lied to me or they protected me, the truth. Misrepresented, removed me from situations where I would know the truth. 
And even as a child, well, perhaps even more so as a child, um, I felt that they were harming me. Yes. And th it is something that I need to forgive them for. Yes. That shielding of me actually reinforced to me, you are not capable of dealing with difficult things, yes. difficult emotions or yes. truth or you can't reason. Pro like it's a lot it's of not either that. It's also self-preserving on the person, who, part yeah. of the person. Who's I don't want it. to deal with you crying. Yeah, so, yeah. It's, it's selfish. Yeah. You know, the, the parent often doesn't want to deal with the child's feelings mm. about it. So, so that's an example so where I might think, oh, my parents were wonderful, they were so caring, but actually I have something to forgive them. That's right, they're not, that's yeah. not caring from God's perspective. Yeah. What's caring is to tell people truth yeah. and to do it in a way that is considerate and loving, but, but you need to tell them the exact truth, every detail. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> every detail. <laughs> you know, so it's sort of like somebody, you know, husband and wife, one of them cheats on the other. And the husband says, I don't want to know what you did. I'm just going yeah. to forgive you. Yeah. You can't forgive something you don't know. Mm. You can't. Actually, mm. that's the truth. You can't forgive something you don't know. But there's an illustration of how what we want. We, yeah. we, we feel that the person's harming us more by telling us the whole truth. No, yes. that's not true. They're actually not harming us more. They're telling us the truth. That's going to enable the process of forgiveness to actually occur in us if we want it to occur. Mm. So you not wanting to know the truth is also mm -hmm. an issue. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because we have all these mixed ideas about that. I know that for people whose children go missing or when there's a murder that happens, like often the instinct is, I want to know exactly what happened mm. to that person. And yet when it comes to other situations where we obviously have some other codependence we want to maintain well, with no, the person. Let's, or... let's put it plainly. We've got investments mm -hmm. in being selfish, in selfishly trying to not feel our own emotions. Yeah. That's really what drives all of this. Yeah. Right? Whereas yeah. when someone's died, it's almost like the worst has already happened. The grief is already overwhelming. Now, naturally, I want to know more, all of the truth. Yeah. But when I'm still trying to prevent something, then don't tell me. Don't tell me, don't tell me, I don't want to know. Yeah. That's a sin from God's yeah. perspective. There's desires to maintain the condition we believe is comfortable. Yeah. Like we see this frequently so happening much. where People say, oh, they want to assist with divine truth or they want to help out or whatever. But, but there's a challenge to the comfort of their own life, mm -hmm. you know, through the environmental challenges that they might mm -hmm. face, you know, changing their lifestyle, changing their relationships and so forth. There's, there's different things that might be challenged. And so they don't want to do it. Yeah. Right. Well, that's actually a sin. You've heard the truth mm -hmm. and you don't want to do it. That, from God's perspective, that's a sin. Mm -hmm. And and yet, from our perspective, we think, oh, no, that's just our choice. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's not a sin. Yeah. But there's actually penalties associated with mm. that sin. So, so, in fact, in that case, I'd have to repent for that situation. Certainly. Myself. Certainly, yeah. 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 There's the desire to justify our personal harm of others. Like, we often do that. We go, oh, I'm angry you with you, yes, but it was because you said this and you did that and mm. you, you know, you cheated on me and you did all these other things to me. That's why I'm angry with you now. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's yes. not why. That's not a truth. And also you desire to be angry with the person who's done all those things is not even uh, like that's harm yeah. from God's perspective. Yeah. So, you know. And, and something else I see commonly is because remembering here we're talking about um, being insensitive to when I've been hurt myself. Often people have this desire to hurt people in the same way that they've been hurt. And that causes them, because they want to keep doing what they're doing, they want to justify that. That causes them to rationalise and detune from the fact that receiving that same treatment actually hurt them. That's right. So they don't see, uh, you see this a lot generationally in parenting and so on, or yeah. between, you know, mothers and daughters and uh, where my mother treated me a certain way and now I'm automatically treating my daughter this way, for example. Um, I don't want to feel that what mum did hurt me because then I might have to deal with the fact that I'm hurting my daughter. That's right. You'll even in that place go, you'll even say, oh, mum did her best and, uh, you know. And she loved me. It was fine and that she still loves me. me. And, yeah. you know, you'll give yourself all of this G up, you know, yeah. because because you can't face the fact that you're doing the same thing to your daughter and it, and it is unloving. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, there, there's a lot of that going on, isn't there, where, mm -hmm. where, where we're frequently saying, we're frequently desiring to not know that others have harmed us because we do the same thing. And if we accepted that somebody else harmed us in that same way, 
then we'd have to accept that we are harming other people in the same way. Yeah. And so we don't want to do that. And so we frequently justify a person's harm of mm -hmm. us in, and and put it even as a as a ah oh, in a love place. Oh, I'm grateful. Oh, they love. I'm yeah. grateful. I did that. You yeah. know. I you know that that they demonstrated their love doing that and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. We'll, we'll do that yeah. in order to not come face to face with ourselves or face to face with the pain that's inside of us. Yeah. We'll as a result of it. Yeah. 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 We often have desires, desires to avoid taking positive action, Stephen. So, mm -hmm. so, for example, the desire to be ethical, desire to be moral, right? So not noticing when you're being harmed is when somebody is encouraging you to be immoral mm -hmm. and you might want that. Yeah. Or somebody's encouraging you to be unethical and yeah. you might want that. Yeah. Right. And there's, there's certain times when you do, like yeah. particularly if you think you might get attacked if you are moral because mm -hmm. there's plenty of people on earth who will attack you if you're moral yeah. and there's plenty of people on earth who will attack you if you're ethical too yeah and and so you you avoid attack so now you want encouragement yeah to 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 avoid morality and ethics and so when somebody does that you think oh they're helping me exactly and you go away feeling happier but actually yeah. you've been harmed yeah so and and also that same desire say there's someone in my environment who's doing something very destructive to the environment um and I just don't want to feel some personal fears about addressing that with the person. I'm just as likely to say there's nothing wrong here. That's right. Because my brain doesn't really even have to engage, as we discussed in the previous section. If that desire is within me precluding any other logic on the matter, I'll just say, no, there's no harm being done. I've got nothing to forgive, even though that person just destroyed A, B and C or yeah. uh, under undermined me or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so so if you look at if you look, and we've only listed a few reasons a few. here as to why we wouldn't notice when we're being harmed, like from God's perspective. Remember, we're talking about being harmed from God's perspective, and frequently we don't notice that we're being harmed from God's perspective because we don't see it as harm. Yes. Whereas God does. Yeah. You know, we don't see these things as harm. We see them as good. Mm -hmm. You know, frequently we want them. Yeah. In other words, we're saying from God's perspective that we want to be harmed mm. because mm. we don't see it as harm. We see the see it as good. Yeah. And, and this is a big problem it for is. us. And and of course, if you don't notice when you're being harmed, you, you don't know what to forgive and you don't know when you need to be repentant for mm. when you harm yeah. others. Right. Yeah. You've got no idea. Yeah. So frequently we, we, we might be there crying because someone told us the truth or crying because somebody didn't feed our addiction or, mm -hmm. or angry because someone didn't feed our addiction and thinking that we're right when from God's perspective we're completely wrong. Yeah. 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 And that's very frequently the case. It is. Mm -hmm. Feeling harm from God's perspective when I am not. So now we talk about this in the converse. <laughs> is it possible to feel I am being harmed when from God's perspective I'm not? What would cause me to believe someone is injuring me when they aren't? Yeah, so the question first, is it possible? Well, no, it's not just possible, it's highly likely. <laughs> <laughs> you know, given yeah. the fact that, that, that people's definitions of love on the planet are severely distorted when they're compared to God's definition of love. And given that God's definition of harm is completely different to the human definition of harm, it's highly likely that I'm feeling I'm being harmed when from God's perspective, I aren't actually being harmed. Yeah. Right. So in the assistance groups, you called uh, the world's definition of love evil, which is love <laughs> literally backwards, yeah. because a lot of times And not is. far removed from evil. <laughs> evil. <laughs> Either. Close neighbour. Yeah. yeah. Um, so basically all of this feeling I'm harmed um, when I'm actually not, uh, all arises from when I have a false definition of love within me. Because then I think love is A, someone does B, which might actually from God's perspective be loving. And I think, well, you've just missed the mark. You're hurting me. And remember, false definitions of love are emotional. Yeah. And they cause us to believe certain things to be true when they're not. That's what they do. Mm -hmm. So all of these false definitions of love are also untruth but they are all emotional. So I have feelings in me. So, so for example, rather than talking about the, the thoughts, if we go, I feel hurt when somebody tells me the truth. Yeah. I feel it. Yeah. Now that, that straight away tells me my definition of love 
is out of harmony with God's definition of love. And my definition of harm is completely opposite to God's definition of harm. Mm -hmm. Because I'm feeling a feeling that says, you telling me the truth is a bad thing. Yeah. Right. What if I feel that you don't support me? Mm. You In don't life. have to support me. So if I feel you're not supporting me and I feel hurt by that, yeah. my, it's my false definition of love. Yeah. I don't, nobody has to support you. Yeah. You're an individual. You stand up on your own right from God's perspective. Mm -hmm. Right. The fact that you feel hurt means that emotionally there is a false definition of love in you about that. Yeah. Right. When it comes to feeling hurt when others don't support my decisions. So I make a decision. I think it's a good one. Somebody else says, oh, that's a stupid decision. And you feel hurt. Yeah. Right. Why would you feel hurt? Mm -hmm. If you feel hurt, there's your false definition of love appearing again. Yeah. Right. That you're allowed to make your own decisions and they're allowed to be completely opposite of what somebody else would do. Mm -hmm. Right. And they're allowed to say that as well. Mm. They're allowed to say, oh, I wouldn't have done that. I think that's a silly decision. <laughs> they're allowed to say that. Yeah. Right? Even if they're wrong, they're allowed to say that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that you feel hurt by it yeah. emotionally is an indication that the false definition of love exists inside of you. The false definition of what is being, what harm is exists mm -hmm. inside of you. Mm -hmm. Right? Being hurt when others ignore me. Or let, everyone's allowed to ignore you right, from God's perspective. Yeah. So if you're hurt that somebody has ignored you, right, then they've got a false definition of love. Now, maybe they wanted to ignore you and they wanted you to feel a bad thing. Well, that's their false definition of love. Yeah. But, but if you did feel hurt that they ignored you, then that's mm -hmm. yours. Mm -hmm. right? I get ignored very frequently, as you know. <laughs> I do know. And, uh, and I don't get very hurt about it because <laughs> everyone's allowed to ignore me yeah. if that's what they want. Feeling hurt when my fears are not supported. Yeah. So when I say supported, most of us have this sort of a concept that, oh, you know, if I'm afraid of something, then you need to make it more comfortable for me to remain afraid of that. Yeah. And you need to, my justifications to remain afraid need to stay in place. And you need to help me have my... Help me avoid action that might challenge those fears. Yeah. Just yeah. change your whole life, actually, to help me not feel afraid. That's right. Yeah. And if you don't do that, you're a bad, terrible person. Yeah. And I feel like you're a terrible person. Now, if you feel that feeling, then you've got a false definition of love. And so you can't accurately assess if you're being harmed. That's right. Yeah. You, you know, that is a harmful definition of love yeah. from God's perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, feeling uh, when others don't meet your demands. This is frequently the case in relationships, you notice how, you know, the husband will do certain things for the wife as long as the wife does certain things for the husband. Yeah. But if she does not do those things for the husband, then the husband starts getting angry at the fact that he's doing these things, but she's not doing her things, right? <laughs> <laughs> is that all too confusing for everyone? No, I love it. It's this. like, I'm doing a whole heap of things for you, but the agreement unwritten yeah. agreement is you need to be doing the things that I want you to do for me as well yep. in order for this to work. Yeah. Right? That's a false definition of love. Yeah. Therefore, hurtful. Yeah. My, I'm being hurtful to you by having it or if you expect that from me, you're being hurtful to me. Yeah. So yeah. frequently, again, most people do that. Yeah. But from God's perspective, false definition of love, false it's definition. an error, it's a sin. It's not actually harm. Well, it's, a, it, it's harm if I have if, the... If I have the response. But if you don't do something out of duty and obligation, it, so if your only motivation for doing something is duty and obligation... Then that's harm. Then that's harm. You're actually harming somebody. Yes, you're giving a false representation of the oh, love yeah. that you feel. So the only person. thing you should be doing is if you love doing it. Yeah. Right. That's when it, when you're not harming. Yeah. When right? it's a gift. You when want it's a gift, give. it's not a duty or an obligation anymore. Yeah. Right. And um, when my addictions are not met by others, right? most people get into this state. Well, you're harming me now. Mm -hmm. You know, I haven't got. Well, if you think about it from a physical perspective, when an alcoholic doesn't get his alcohol, he thinks everyone's harming him. Mm -hmm. When a drug addict doesn't get his drugs, he thinks everyone's harming him. Yeah. Are they being harmed? No, they're being helped actually. Yeah. Right. Same applies emotionally, though, right? If I've got an addiction for a certain emotion mm -hmm. and I don't get it, that's actually a good thing yes. for me. Yeah. But I often will think it's not. Mm. Right? I think it's harm. The fact that I feel that it is harm mm -hmm. shows me that emotionally 
I have no idea what God's definition of harm is inside and, of me. And it's a, as I mentioned earlier, it's a wasted sort of a, a grief almost. It's not a true grief. It's actually a tantrum grief. Yeah. Of course, sadness. Of yeah. course, it's a tantrum. It's yeah. an anger-based tantrum, yeah. which always indicates the underlying emotion is out of harmony with God's love. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But uh, but you know we could go on you know, for days on this subject, <laughs> couldn't we? Like listing all the different things that we do that we believe are good, yeah. But actually, from God's perspective, are harm. Yes. You know, and and obviously, at the end of the day. If you really want to progress and you want to have a relationship with God and you really are going to engage forgiveness and repentance, you've got to have God's definition of what harm is, not your own. So I have a personal question for you about that because you're someone who, by your own admission, you know, still has uh, emotions which preclude God's truth about certain matters within you. Definitely. Um, however, it's very striking to live with you and observe the way you employ logic about when you are being harmed and when you aren't. So even though um, there's times where you might even feel sad about something, I've watched you over the years say, well, hang on, no, that's coming from a, a, an expectation that I have. That's unloving. That's unloving, and I know that. My question for you then is, do you feel that that comes as a result of either A, receiving some of God's love within you, so having more of a sense of um, uh, and a sense of what real love constitutes, as in it never involves expectation or obligation, and you know that emotionally, even though you might still have a remaining precluding emotion? Or it seems to me, B, it's also supported by your very strong commitment to become a self-responsible person entirely. And so you, you hold yourself to an account that I've never encountered in anyone else. Um, or is it something, just a connection to the conscience that assists you to Well, do I, that? I don't think it's any one of those things. Right. I, think, I think it's a combination it's a of all of those deal. things. Yeah. yeah. Firstly, when you've got a connection to the conscience, even if you try to ignore you know, you feel like you've been harmed, yeah. but if you try to ignore it, if you've got a connection to conscience, God's saying, no, you haven't been harmed, it's just your feelings. Yes. It's just you need to feel something about yeah. this. Yeah. And sure, and, and even what I've learned now is that God's often saying to me, yes, you have been harmed, mm -hmm. but you still, still need to feel something feelings. about this. Yes, I get that one too. <laughs> right, <laughs> yes, because quite, quite frequently that happens where yeah. God is saying to me, yes, you have been harmed, but to stay in a space where you don't forgive the harm is going to cause you damage, yeah. right? And, and this is something I'm working through a lot lately, just yeah. how much harm gets perpetrated at times yeah. and then having to forgive each time. Uh, and, uh, and that, you know, that is, a, and learning the lessons of like, what do I do under those circumstances even in terms of the loving thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all part of this process of growth towards the one with God, in fact. Mm -hmm. So there's the conscience mechanism at work. There's also the desire for ethics, mm -hmm. which means that I, I don't, you know, if I, if, if I have a demand that you meet, then you're allowed to ethically, would be allowed to have demands that I should have to meet. Yeah. Now I can see straight away that that wouldn't be good, right? So, so I have a very strict viewpoint of ethics in mm -hmm. the sense that I would never demand of you something that I feel that you, sh you know, that I shouldn't demand something of you, and I'll also never demand something of you that I would not respond to a demand of from you. Isn't that interesting, though? It's more out of your love of me that you don't want me to have to feel obligated to a demand that you have. Then, is that what really? Yeah, because at the moment, one of the areas that God's trying to get me to work on is love of self, right? Yeah. So, so, and obviously, this is an area where I haven't been yeah. as good as other areas, yeah. and so that's something that God's been, you know, showing me a lot about, you know, in terms of, you know learning to love myself even though very few people around me love me so so you know try you know trying to get through work through those emotions the the third thing is the issues of mor morals like mm -hmm. what is morals from god's perspective is it moral to demand something of somebody else that that you're not willing to give 
or even if you are willing to give it, does it cause damage to somebody or something? Mm -hmm. If you did, mm -hmm. and and if it does, then it's not moral to do it. But there's a reasoning you're doing in answering all of these questions that's not purely intellectual, is it? No, because uh, well, there's also the fact that I've processed a lot of emotions. That was the other thing. You know, I feel obviously, you're very sensitive. twenty-five years ago, before I started processing emotions, um, I had far less capability of determining, particularly determining uh, when others were harming me. Mm. You know, like I, back then, I'd do almost anything and work myself into the ground mm. for the sake of other people. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it was, a, and, and it caused a lot of destruction in my life as a result, uh, even to me personally, but also family and other, other things too. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I've learned that was a sin, you yeah. know, in, in doing that, you know, back then I was driven to do that all the time. And so, so I learned, learned that through, through the law, basically, mm -hmm. through the law showing me uh, something that I was resistive to emotionally, understanding or listening to God about, the law showed me, no, that was wrong, you mm -hmm. know. And during that time in my life, I was very sick and very, yeah. uh, very unwell all the time. Yeah. Uh, and, and often in a lot of pain and suffering, yeah. emotionally and physically. So, so I would say there's also this thing of removing from yourself emotions, mm. which is a part of the, you know, process as well. If you're not emotion, if you don't have emotional clarity, mm. you're not capable of logical thinking. So, so once I let go of specific emotions, I found that I had a lot more capability to have logical thinking mm. and a lot more capability of being able to receive God's truth via the conscience. So those two, you know, that the dealing with my emotions in a sincere manner mm -hmm. had had a large effect on it as well. And then there's the issue of desire. Mm -hmm. What do I desire? Mm -hmm. Well, I desire a relationship with God in the end. So if I'm not there yet where I'm back into being in a condition of a, uh, sort of at one with God, then my feeling is that I need to work on whatever it is I need to work on to get through that. Yeah. And, and so for, most of the, for, for the most part, I'm self-reflective about every single thing first before I reflect upon what another person's feelings are. Yeah. And I also choose to feel my feelings first before I reflect mm -hmm. as well or, or take action. Yeah. Thanks for answering because I feel that you are an example to everyone. And I feel that if... Not a perfect example yet though. No, you're, you're an inspiration to me and an example to me. And I have the privilege of spending a lot of personal time with you. Mm. Um, and I see the way that you hold yourself to it to account on those matters that you just spoke about. And I see yeah, but not that, in a self punishing way either. No, or a self so self, way. self account is perhaps a wrong way. It perhaps indicates sort of a rigidity, whereas I feel it's a developed desire within you to be self responsible, which is why I said it in the intro. Yeah, but I'm not, uh, I don't persecute myself for having flaws like other people try to do to me yes. frequently. Um, but, but, I, but I do see the need to address the flaws, whatever they be. Yes, you, you, so you've developed love of self enough that you're not like harshly critical upon yourself. Um, because you know God isn't like that with you. Yeah, I don't know. I see, see I still haven't worked through that completely. So yeah. there are times when I am yeah. harshly critical <laughs> of myself, um, which is a which is a, a sin thing. from yeah. God's perspective, yeah. and I need to work my way through it, which I am yeah. trying to do. Yeah. Um, but I don't stop. I don't give up doing it or, no. or avoid doing it. Yeah. So maybe I can rephrase what I was going to say to say i see in you a well-developed desire for self-responsibility which opens you to inspiration the conscience god and also drives you in very very many loving actions hmm. so you have developed this very strong desire for self-responsibility I, I think even greater than that though is a strong desire for truth and god yeah, yeah. well both you know yeah. like i i see i see truth and god almost as synonymous like one of yeah. god's largest qualities yeah. you know god is truth yeah. and just like god is love mm -hmm. and i just sort of see that truth leads to love so truth is more important sometimes yeah. and when i say more important it's not you know it, it is a it is a 
a facet of love mm -hmm. that cannot be avoided. Yeah. So, so it, it's very important because truth leads you to love. Mm -hmm. It feels to me like, as I keep reminding people, the three basic things, a desire for love, a desire for truth and be humble mm -hmm. they, they, and have faith, you know, those maybe four things. And they are the key parts to living your life. Mm -hmm. And if you live your life that way, you will get through everything eventually. Yeah. Now, it might not be while you're on earth, but you will get through everything eventually. I might not, this second time around, I might not complete it on earth. Mm. I don't know. Mm. Uh, like it's an experiment. Yeah. Uh, that's the way it is. I, I've got a lot of very deep problems to resolve and I've ha have already resolved a lot of very deep problems. But this problem of worth is a, like, one, I feel is my worst problem. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, having those four qualities is a necessary part of or those four desires is a necessary part of dealing with them all. Mm. So I sort of feel, if, yeah, if everyone gets back to the basics, you will go through this process and you will eventually understand forgiveness and repentance by going through that process. Mm. Mm. Uh, the reason I raised it is because it came up in relation to sensitivity to when I'm being harmed and when I'm harming others. So mm. I see within you a very strong sensitivity to when you may be harming others mm. and, a, and a deep felt desire to not harm others. Mm. I see over the years how it's been difficult for you at times to, oh well, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but there has been some problems with discerning when other people are harming you. I've had a huge amount of problems with that. Yeah. Yeah, huge amount of problems over my life. There's been a, a few occasions when I have actually, from God's perspective, harmed others. Uh, when I say a few, where I've done it um, in in an emotional state, yep. you know. And so not based on just a set of false beliefs that you sincerely felt that they were loving. Yeah. You mean in a state where you went, no. Where well, I was just upset, yeah. you know. Yeah. And I can count them on my hands. Yeah. But, but, um, but every one of them, you know, afterwards distressed me a lot. Yeah. So, so I've learned, you know, obviously you've, you've got to still allow your emotions, but the far better alternative is to not take them out on people, yeah. you know. Well, and it, it's sort of the reason I raise it is it flies in the face of a lot of common thought on earth today, which is, Unless you really love yourself, you can't love others. And to me, it sounds like uh, when I observe your example, no, unless you really know love and the qualities of love, then you can't love others. So or yourself. Uh, or yourself, yeah. So it seems to me that you have, you do have some understanding of love, which is what enables you to love others so consistently. But obviously, as we've mentioned, there's some problems with understanding how that applies to you. Which, yeah, although, you know, if most people were under the sort of um, pr pressure I've been under from a love of self perspective, yes. most people would not survive it. So um, the reality is that, um, you know, I've had to learn love of self through extreme duress, you know, yeah. whereas loving others I find easier yeah. because I'm not under so much duress, duress when yeah. I do it. Although, you know, people do attack me for loving them, you know, loving people God's way yeah. is different than loving people their way. Yeah. And uh, people attack me for that. But, but I don't attack myself for that. So mm -hmm. uh, I don't attack myself for, for loving a person and they not understanding that I'm loving them, if that makes sense. It makes sense. Mm. I think it's awesome because mm. I still struggle with that sometimes. Yeah. Um, but we, if, if I, if, let's face it, you're back here on a planet where a good majority of the planet believes that you shouldn't love, you, you should die for their sins, let them off. Yeah, sacrifice so myself. Yeah. Sacrifice yourself. So it is a lot, yeah. it's an immense amount of pressure from a well, uh, You know, I get emotions from what, nearly 2 billion people about that. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, obviously I've had to, you know, when I was younger, it was very, very hard for me to deal with those emotions. Um, and then there's also, you know, extreme amount of rage and anger towards the, the Christian faith from all sorts yeah. of people, you know, from other faiths and also from women yeah. in, in particular and so forth that blame me for specific things, which to a degree I accepted the blame through my childhood experience. Yeah. And so I've had to work learn th through a lot of emotions about myself and love mm -hmm. of self and what is really me harming somebody else and what is not and things like that. And so it's taken me a long time to work through those emotions and, I, and I'm still working through them, to be, yeah. to be honest. And I don't know how long it's going to take me to work through the ones I've got left. 
But the what I am finding is that if I'm resistant to the process of forgiveness or repentance, that's when I really notice it physically and emotionally. You know, that's when I get knocked yeah. around. Yeah. And, you know, there are times when I am resistive, so I get knocked around a lot. When you've got millions of spirits who want to knock you around, mm -hmm. when you are resistive, you get knocked around a lot. Um, so yeah, and, and also because, um, as we've mentioned in this discussion, the people around you are being influenced by these spirits as well. It's not just you. No. It's, there's a lot of pressure on all of us who are around you to um, perpetuate, to uphold your lack of love of self. And also to perpetuate false beliefs uh, yeah. that, that I've no longer accepted as, you know, as true. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, a lot of people try to put pressure on me to do something that they believe I should be doing yeah. uh, when I know I can't do it or shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. Yeah, and so, so yeah, the, there's a lot of times when, you know, a person might be being harmed and, and you learn to be a good forgiver. In the yeah, end. that's what I see in you, honey, and it's beautiful. Yeah, I'm still not like what I'd call perfect at it, you know. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, and that's uh, that's upsetting me now. Yeah. Like before, it, there were times when it didn't upset me, you know. I felt sort of still felt sort of angry or resentful, but now, um, you know, it upsets me that I'm not forgiving all the time. Yeah. Um, so that's something that I'm still working through and, mm -hmm. and trying to work through, but. You know, these are these are things. If you can work through these particular things, then you've got a much closer relationship with God. You you know what the truth is. You're a lot more settled in yourself. Yeah. Your you, your logic is a lot clearer, and every choice you make is a lot more beneficial to yourself and others. And and that's the other thing that I see in you is that even when you're getting knocked around or things are going bad or whatever your kind of i keep using these funny words but they come to mind you're, like your allegiance to truth and love your your dedication your deep desire which is enacted mm. um it gives you a sense of peacefulness even it, like i feel in you you would be far more distressed if you bowed to the pressure yeah. and you know you you feel better about yourself and i'm mentioning it again because i feel it's an example to others you feel better and more, uh, I can't find the right word for it, but I see it in you because you know it's not pride and it's not, um, it's not peacefulness necessarily, but there's a sense of self that you get to maintain or something. What is that thing you're maintaining? I feel it's it, a I connection to God via the conscience. It's yeah. like, to my mind, that is one of the most important you know relationships you can maintain yeah and and whenever whenever that relationship is distressed in any way yeah uh, i feel distress yeah so so i've learned through through the years that it's far better for me even even under extreme duress mm -hmm. it's far better for me to stay close to my relationship with god than it is to do anything else yeah and that means it's far better for me to be truthful than it is to do anything else far better for me to be loving than to do anything else and even when i have feelings that people that you know i still have some feelings that the average person ha has or yeah. maybe not what the average people have but uh, i still have feelings about you know some things that um that i need to work my way through and um, the the reality is maintaining those two connections are, is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And I get pretty distressed when I can't maintain those two things. And and perhaps that's one thing I need to feel about too, how much distress I get when I can't maintain those things. <laughs> but, but you and I have been through quite a number of experiences together, you know, like we went on uh, TV in Britain and there was a huge viewership and, and a lot of instances dealing with things that, um, were quite exposing or whatever and what i saw during those experiences you you almost faced them with a lot more calm i'm not saying you didn't have other emotions going on i mean you've been verbally attacked by journalists on a number of occasions mm. but you maintain this because you want to maintain those connections with god and the conscience you deal with those situations so much better than I did in those same situations with you because I didn't yet develop those desires. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, like I, sometimes I feel I, I wasn't nervous or any of those kind of no, things. No. And that's, 
I'm not. I've dealt with a lot of emotions about being ner- I, like I was extremely nervous as a child and everything. Mm-hmm. And and even when I was public speaking, I was extremely nervous. Now I'm not. Mm-hmm. But but um, I still feel that again, there's more work to do there yeah. in terms of worth, self worth. Because once you have a a really close connection with God and and you are in agreement with God about your own worth, mm-hmm. then you can go through any situation of attack mm-hmm. and not have any feeling of uh, you know any feeling at all about your worth being pulled down yeah and that that you know i remember that state yeah i do uh, too and that's um you know the fact that that's the state like that's one of my big driving factors of doing what i keep doing Mm -hmm. is is i remember that state and i want to have that state back (laughs) (laughs) with such a powerful my memory of you being in that state on earth it just it's it's life altering for anyone who who's in contact with you. It's such a gift of love. And most mm. people don't understand that 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 level of connectedness with your worth with God is actually a gift of love to others as mm. well. You mm. know, I remember how impactful it was for me and everyone around you. Yeah. And, and I feel a lot of ways nowadays people are not very impacted by my presence because of the issue of worth. Whereas yeah. back back in the first century, people were always impacted by my presence uh, because of the issue of worth, because the average person doesn't have those feelings about themselves. Yeah. And and it is uh, the issue of worth. I do believe is is one of the most severe problems on the planet. Yeah. And 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 I do understand why I'm having so much difficulty going through it this time, mm-hmm. compared uh, to you know because nobody has ever really gone through it on Earth at all. Mm-hmm. And I didn't go through it on Earth in the first century either. Mm-hmm because I didn't need to, yeah. um, but, but I do now. And uh, I feel one reason why we chose to do it this way is because it would have the most impact mm-hmm. uh, upon ha- helping other people go through the same experience. So yeah, there's a whole reasons why we've chosen what we've chosen, but I just, I do feel that if you can maintain your connection with God and you can maintain your connection with truth, God's truth, yeah. And you are willing to stay humble and have faith in God's goodness. You can get pretty much through anything is what I've, when I say pretty much, you definitely can get through anything. And perhaps that's another one of the qualities that I see, that I feel and I see enacted in you is faith in what you just said. Mm. You, Whenever you learn new truth, even if you have personal emotions about it, you know, it's not just, a, oh, I've got to tell myself it's better. No, you know it's better. You, you're yeah, I, don't, often... I don't know if I'd call it faith. It's a, well, I, I know it to be fact. Isn't faith the knowledge? Well, really? faith is a future knowledge based on a past fact, whereas yeah. I know yeah. that dealing with my emotions is fact. Mm-hmm. Like I, I don't, like it doesn't, I know I get closer to God when I have, you know, yeah. when, I, when I'm humble, mm-hmm. when I desire truth, they're facts. I, to me, to me though, irrefutable. Nobody could convince me differently. Yeah. So that's why I do what I do. Yeah. yeah. Well, I love you and I think it's really beautiful. Mm. And yes, thank you. And thank you for sharing so freely about yourself because I know sometimes um, you feel like you wish you were further progressed, but I, I just see what an example it is, even at this point where you are, these things that I feel and the things that I see in you are all gifts that all of us can have if we develop those same desires and act on those same desires mm. that you have. Mm. And so I want to acknowledge you for that. Mm. Thanks, Bay.